In this presentation, we will focus on Mosiah chapters 4 through 6. So let's begin with Mosiah chapter 4. By way of introduction, the Nephites listened to King Benjamin rec the Nephites listening to King Benjamin recognized their need for the redeeming power of the atonement. As a result, they prayed for forgiveness, received peace of conscience, and took upon themselves the name of Christ. Like those Nephites, we can also experience a change of heart and live in such a way that we will always rejoice and be filled with the love of God and always retain a remission of our sins. King Benjamin's sermon instructs us how to grow in the knowledge of the glory of Him that created us through faith, repentance, and making and keeping covenants. Now let's turn to chapter 4, verse 1, the phrase, Fallen to the earth. In many cultures of the ancient world, prostration was a manifestation of reverence, respect, or overwhelming awe. Such instances in the Book of Mormon re represent a distinctive cultural phenomenon. Because such outward manifestations are not as evident among people today, however, it should not be supposed that the truly converted do not experience those same poignant feelings. The phrase, fear of the Lord, meant, as used among Old Testament peoples, the fear of the Hebrew, Yira, is also rendered as reverence or respect. The righteous long to attain the divine presence. Fear in the sense of fright is the companion of the wicked. Chapter 4, verse 2, the phrase, in their own carnal state, meant, in their Edenic state, the bodies of Adam and Eve, though physical, were incorruptible, immortal, and free from all taint of sin. With the fall came the potential for consuming lust of the flesh, the birth of carnal man, which many of their children became. The carnal man is one who has yielded to the, proud, the loud and vulgar inclinations to gratify the flesh as opposed to their quiet enticements of the Holy Spirit to put off the natural man and put on Christ. Though in the ultimate sense every act of virtue and ability will be rewarded, if we have not placed the God of heaven and obedience to his commandments first, it does not matter what we have chosen as a substitute. The remission of sins, the power to sanctify, is found only in Christ. Thus a good people like those to whom King Benjamin spoke remain in a carnal state until they recognize Christ as their king repent of their sins, and place their allegiance to, this king, uh, to his kingdom above all else. We must come to learn, brothers and sisters, to totally submit our will to the will of the Father and of Christ if we are going to overcome the natural man. Chapter, two, chapter 4, verse 2, the phrase, Less than the dust of the earth had reference to, this is not a statement of the moral depravity of man, but rather a commentary on man's propensity towards disobedience. Helaman 12 says, Oh, how great is the nothingness of the children of man, lamented Mormon, yea, even they are less than the dust of the earth. For behold, the dust of the earth moveth hither and thither to the dividing asunder at the command of the great and everlasting God. King's Benjamin people viewed themselves even less than the dust of the earth. This expression described the fact that while the dust of the earth is obedient to the commands of God, they as God's children have not always been obedient to his commands. They recognize their utter dependency upon God. At <clears throat> that man must rely upon God for everything, life and breath, food and the ability to produce it, health and strength, salvation and eternal life. Without God in the atonement, man is, in a very real sense, nothing. Humility comes from realizing our dependency upon the Lord. 
The key to our greatness is to remember our nothingness without Christ and his atonement. As Jacob taught, if there were no atonement, we would never live again, and we would become angels to the devil. So, without Christ, we literally can do nothing. We are less than dust the earth. With Christ, we can become everything, even joint heirs with Jesus Christ to the Father. Chapter 4, verse 2, cried aloud with one voice, meant, There is no reason to suppose that this represented anything more than a united, but perhaps for some of them unspoken, expression of all present. The people were of one heart and one mind. A litany of words was not necessary to convey their unity of spirit. The phrase in verse 2, apply the atoning blood of Christ, meant, the blood of Christ is central to the remission of sins, no matter what the decree of remorse, the extent of restitution, or the compliance with our often cited list of requisites for repentance. Any and all efforts towards godly sorrow and ultimate forgiveness must center in that redemption that is found only in Christ and his atoning blood. In verse 2, the phrase, For we believe in Jesus Christ, Elder Bruce R. McConkie expressed, Belief in the true gospel sense, and as commonly used in the scriptures, means faith. Thus, to gain salvation, mankind must believe in Christ, or in other words, have faith in him. True belief in Christ is measured not alone in the mental acceptance of his atoning blood, but in leaving the state of carnality, our association with worldliness, and become citizens of the state of holiness in which he, Christ, resides. Joseph Smith explained, A religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. Religious systems that require no more then the profession of belief can never deliver men from the bondage of sin. By denying their followers the privilege of sacrifice, of their worldliness, and of their will, they thereby prevent those same adherents from developing that saving faith in Christ, which leads unto eternal life. Another way to look at the sacrifice of all things can also mean that we completely submit our will to Christ's will. So in other words, a religion that does not require complete submission to the will of Christ will not produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. Mosiah chapter 4 verses 2 through 3 applying the atoning blood of Christ meant King Benjamin's people recognized their need for power beyond their own to overcome their sinful condition. They prayed for mercy and asked the Father, apply the atoning blood of Christ so they could be forgiven of their sins. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught how the atonement can heal us of our errors. Quote, we all make mistakes. Sometimes we harm ourselves and seriously injure others in ways that we alone cannot repair. We break things that we alone cannot fix. It is then in our nature to feel guilty and humiliation and suffering, which we alone cannot cure. That is when the healing power of the atonement will help. If Christ had not made his atonement, the penalties for mistakes would be added one on the other. Life would be hopeless, but he willingly sacrificed in order that we may be redeemed. We can even retain a remission of our sins. Baptism by immersion is for the remission of our sins. That covenant can be renewed by partaking of the sacrament each week. The atonement has practical, personal, everyday value applying it in your life. It can be activated with so simple a beginning as prayer. 
you will not thereafter be free from trouble and mistake, but can erase the guilt to repentance and be at peace. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 3, the phrase filled with joy, having peace of conscience, referred to. Joy and peace are the words most common to scriptural texts describing the presence of the Holy Spirit. People frequently ask, how can I tell when I have received a remission of our sins? Our text suggests three ways by which one may know that his sins have been remitted. One, he is filled with joy. That is, he delights in fellowship with those of the household of faith. His confidence once again begins to wax strong in the presence of the Lord. The word of the Lord becomes sweet to the taste, and the strength of the Lord enables him to bear life's burdens with perspective. Number two, he is filled with peace. The spirit of the adversary brings with it such feelings as confusion, uncertainty, disorder, misery, stupor, darkness, and unhappiness. In contrast, the Spirit of the Lord produces certitude, order, comfort, clarity of thought, light, and happiness. Number three, the favors and blessings of the Holy Ghost, the gifts of the Spirit, are manifest in his life. Inasmuch as no one thing clean can dwell in the divine presence, companionship with the Holy Ghost is a sure sign that one's sins have been remitted. President Boyd K. Packer admonished those who seek peace of conscience through repentance to persevere until they obtain forgiveness. Quote, the gospel teaches us that relief from torment and guilt can be earned through repentance, save for those who defect to perdition after having known a fullness there is no habit no addiction no rebellion no tra transgression no offense exempt from the promise of complete forgiveness only the sons of perdition will not be able to complete forgiveness other than that there is nothing that is beyond the control of christ to atone and help us repent and be forgiven of now back to alert Packer's quote, that great morning of forgiveness may not come at once. Do not give up if at first you fell. Often the most difficult part of repentance is to forgive yourself. Discouragement is a part of that test. Do not give up. That brilliant morning will come. Then the peace of God which passeth understanding comes into your life once again. Then you, like him, will remember your sins no more. How will you know? You will know. End of quote. Chapter 4, verse 5, the phrase, A sense of your nothingness and your worthlessness, and your worthless and fallen state. Now for this cause, I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never supposed, Moses declared, have been granted a vision of the grandeur and greatness of God and his creations. Such feelings naturally attend the realization of our total dependency upon the power and blessings of heaven. We are as nothing in comparison to God. We have not even the power to make one hair white or black, let alone add a single cubit to our stature. Yet the miracle of man is the great, greatest evidence of God, for we have within us the power, through the atonement and the grace of God, to become as he is. In the vision referred to above, Moses also learned that he was created in the similitude of the only begotten, and that he too could obtain a fullness of grace and truth. So to always retain a sense of our nothingness and worth of some fallen state just means always retaining a remembrance of our humility and that without Christ we are nothing. To always retain a state of being in humble and recognizing that Christ is everything and that we are nothing without him. But with him, we can become everything. Because of the fall, all mankind are in a state of worthlessness, meaning that without the saving of atonement, we would forever remain lost in a fallen world and remain in the grave. 
King Benjamin is not trying to attack our self-esteem by stating we are nothing and worthless, but to teach things as they really are, which is that without the Savior and the Atonement, we can do nothing, as John 15.5 points out, which says, I, Christ, am the vine, ye are the branches. He that bideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Hence we could also become nothing. Hence our need for complete dependency upon Christ to enable us to overcome the world and sin and the grave and obtain a celestial glory. So that therefore then with Christ you can do and become everything. Chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, the phrase, the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world, meant these verses constitute a marvelous summary of the plan of salvation. A knowledge of God, his attributes, the central role of the atonement which was prepared and instituted in the pre-existence, the necessity of keeping the commandments and enduring to the end. All these are mentioned. Such expressions as the atonement prepared from the foundation of the world affirm that the plan of salvation was known and taught even before the creation of the earth. Further, we are taught that the atonement comes in answer to the fall. That is, Christ atoned for the fall since the fall. Christ atoned for all since the fall of Adam. Those who have postulated the, the existence of pre Adamites create the theological difficulty of having creatures not subject to the fall and therefore not eligible for the redeeming effects of the atonement. In other words, the doctrine of a pre-Adamite civilization is false and not doctrinally sound. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency testified of the need for every Latter-day Saint to study and accept the Atonement. Quote, My beloved brothers and sisters and friends, I come humbly to this pulpit this morning because I wish to speak about the greatest event in all history. That singular event was the incomparable atonement of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. This was the most transcendent act that has ever taken place, yet it is the most difficult to understand. My reasoning for wanting to learn all I can about the atonement is partly selfish. Our salvation depends on believing in and accepting the atonement. Such acceptance requires a continual effort to understand it more fully. The atonement advances our mortal course of learning by making it possible for our natures to become perfect. All of us have sin and need to repent to fully pay our part of the debt. When we sincerely repent, the Savior's magnificent atonement pays the rest of that debt. End of quote. That part that we could never pay, Christ paid. Chapter 4, verse 8, the phrase, there is none other salvation, meant salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, power, and dominion which Jehovah possesses, taught Joseph Smith, and in nothing else, and no being can possess it but himself or one like him. We are handily we are hardly at liberty to pick and choose among various redemptive plans. While it may be true in the ancient world that all roads lead to Rome, it is equally true that there is but one entrance or road to the Holy of Holies. There is and can be only one salvation, and thus there is and can, only be, can be only one Savior. Chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, the phrase, Accept the conditions which I have told you, refers to, We do not barter where salvation is concerned. As there is one salvation and one Savior, so we obtain that blessed state on God's terms and His alone. The terms of salvation rest with Him, who has the power to call forth the body from the grave of the dust and grant it the full glories of the celestial realm. 
We must believe in the correct beliefs and conditions that God says salvation is based on. Joseph Smith taught that a correct idea of the character of God is necessary in order to exercise faith unto life and salvation. Quote, without the knowledge of all things, God would not be able to save any portion of his creatures, the prophet taught, for it is by reason of the knowledge which he has of all things from the beginning to the end that enable him to give that understanding to his creatures by which they are made partakers of eternal life. And if it were not for the idea existing in the minds of men that God had all knowledge, it would be impossible for them to exercise faith in him. And it is not less necessary that men should have the idea of the existence of the attribute, the attribute power in deity. For unless God had power over all things and was able by his power to control all things and thereby deliver his creatures who put their trust in him from the power of all beings that might seek their destruction, whether in heaven on earth or in hell, men could not be saved. So Christ must have all power and all knowledge. I would not worship a being that did not have all power and all knowledge because then he may learn something that should have saved us and then he ceases to become God. I testify God has all power and all knowledge and his grace is sufficient. Chapter 4, verse 10, the phrase, See that ye do them. He that repents and does the commandments of the Lord shall be given, Dr. Covenants 1 states. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God, in John 3. Christ, our example, Christ, our exemplar in all things, clothed himself in the simple robes of righteousness, eschewing the fine twine linen of those who choose to be served rather than to serve. Chapter 4, verse 11, the phrase always retain in remembrance the greatness of God and our, our own nothingness and his goodness and long-suffering towards you unworthy creatures. This phrase is referring to a part of humility is knowing our proper relationship with God. That is, that we are nothing without the atoning sacrifice of the Savior and that we do not merit salvation in and of ourselves because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, making us unworthy to dwell in his kingdom. Remembering the importance of daily prayer, the, stir, the spiritual nourishment so needed to resist the sins of the world. See, for example, the critical nature of prayer as expressed in D.C. 6833. Thus seeking to be steadfast, fixed, firm, or unwavering. Stead comes from an old English word meaning place, as in homestead. It is where we sink our roots and make our home. Thus, to be steadfast in the faith is to be constant and consistent in living by faith. No word in the scripture better describes spiritual maturity than does steadfast, which enables us to taste of the love of God, to have the savor to have savored the richness of his mercies and condescensions, to have known firsthand the joy of his redeeming power. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. The phrase, if you do this, you shall always rejoice, being filled with God's love, retain a remission of your sins, and grow in the knowledge of God, meant as we are expected to be steadfast in keeping the faith, so we are entitled to expect that the blessings that flow therefrom will be equally con constant. Those who keep their covenants will have cause to rejoice in this life and in the life to come. Those who return to their sins are as a dog turned to its vomit, or as the sow to, that was washed returning to the wallow in the mire. One cannot return to sin and profess to have repented of it. To repent is to abandon sin, not just to sin less frequently. 
through the waters of baptism and the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost, we can receive a remission of sins. We retain that remission of sins by faithful observance of covenants we have made with God and through Christ-like service to those in need. Repentance, the remission of sins, and steadfastness are the prerequisites identified by King Benjamin for obtaining a knowledge of God. Peter, having listed attributes of godliness, said, If these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Alma taught that the mysteries of God were granted according to our heed and diligence, See, according to our steadfastness. Joseph Smith, teaching the same principle, used the phrase diligence and obedience. In each instance, the principle is the, is the same. We can know God only to the extent that we seek to live his commandments and be like him. To have a knowledge of that which is just and true is to be conversant with those principles which are lawful and reliable. It is to know with perfect confidence that through the keeping of covenants one receives the fullness of heavenly blessings. This knowledge and witness of God and his goodness will keep us from the desire to injure one another and to live peaceably with one another. And this knowledge that having perfect confidence in his covenants will only come through a witness of the Holy Ghost, and it can be obtained. That witness we can have. Elder Neil A. Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, counseled us to frequently and regularly repent to retain a remission of sins. Quote, Much emphasis was given by King Benjamin to retain a remission of our sins. We do not ponder that concept very much in the church. We ought to think of it a lot more. Retention clearly depends on the regularity of our repentance. In the church, we worry and should over the retention of new members. But the retention of our remissions is cause for even deeper concern. End of quote. Chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. The constant necessity of parents to provide for the temporary needs of their children ought to be a reminder of the great responsibility to provide for their spiritual needs. We have no more right to neglect the spiritual welfare of our families than refuse them food and clothing. I have commanded you, the Savior said to those of our dispensation, to bring up your children in light and truth. As the family, a proclamation to the world states, parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, and to teach them to love and serve one another, and to observe the commandments of God. Elder Russell M. Nelson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles identified several scriptures that help parents understand their role. Quote, Scriptures direct parents to teach faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Parents are to teach the plan of salvation and the importance of living in complete accord with the commandments of God. Otherwise, their children will surely suffer in the ignorance of God's redeeming and liberating law. Parents should also teach by example how to consecrate their lives using their time, talents, tithing, and substance to establish the church and kingdom of God upon the earth. Living in that manner will literally bless their posterity. Chapter 4, verses 16 through 25. You will administer of your substance unto him that standeth in need. Means, King Benjamin reminded us that we are all beggars before God, and that we should show mercy to others if we expect mercy in return. As Amulek pointed out, if ye turn away the needy and the naked, and visit not the sick and afflicted, and a part of your substance, if ye have to those who stand in need, I say unto you, if ye do not any of these things, behold, your prayer is vain, and availeth you nothing, and ye are as hypocrites who deny the faith. Therefore, if ye do not remember to be charitable, ye are as dross, which the refiners do cast out, it being of no worth, and is trodden under the foot of men. End of Almielic's quote. Similarly, President Gordon 
B. Hinckley counseled us to look upon others with compassion. Quote, let us be more merciful. Let us get the arrogance out of our lives, the conceit, the egotism. Let us be more compassionate, gentler, filled with forbearance and patience, and a greater measure of respect one for another. In doing so, our very example will cause others to be more merciful, and we shall have greater claim upon the mercy of God, who in his love will be generous towards us. For behold, are we not all beggars? So spoke King Benjamin, to which I add that the power of the Master is certain and his word is true. He will keep his promise towards those who are compassionate. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I am confident that a time will come for each of us when, whether because of sickness or infirmity, or of poverty or distress, of oppressive measures against us by man or nature, we will wish for mercy. And if through our lives we have granted mercy to others, we will obtain it for ourselves. End of President Hinckley's quote. Chapter 4, verse 19. Are we not all beggars? Meant all are indebted to others. None can work out their salvation alone. None can give birth to themselves, nurture themselves as children, remit their own sins, nor call themselves forth from the grave in a glorious resurrection. Indeed, there has never been a soul whose life has not been enriched by others, who has not reaped where he did not sow, pluck where he did not plant, and enjoy that for which he did not labor. As all are dependent upon the nurturing help of others, so all are required to extend those same blessings to those in need. Greatness is found in the ability to give, not in the strength to take. He that is greatest among you, Christ declared, shall be your servant. Without service, there is no greatness. Chapter 4, verse 21. God doth grant whatsoever is right, meaning, as God grants only that which is right, so must we. We must give as freely as God gives, seeking to do so in the wisdom that is His. Unwise giving can create addiction, indolence, and dependence. It can be destructive to the character and spirit of man. We need to be careful that we do not enable others in their sins out of a misguided sense of compassion. We must be wise in what and how we give. The idler shall not have place in the church, the Lord declared, except he repent and mend his ways. If any provide not for his, mo his own, Paul wrote, and specifically for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. God who possesses the attribute of charity in its perfection is our pattern for appropriate giving. He has promised to give us all that we ask, which is right, or that is expedient. He has said, if you ask anything that is not expedient for you, it shall turn into your own condemnation. So too, we must be careful in what giving within our families and working with others, that we do not give to others which is wrong or which is not expedient. And that would only be known by the power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 4, verse 22, the phrase, If ye judge the man and condemn him, meant the constant need to choose that which is right and proper, be in actions or associations, is inherent in the very nature of our mortal probation. Honoring gospel covenants and revering the name of Christ, which we have taken upon ourselves, requires constant judgments. To that end, the saints of all ages have been given the gift of the Holy Ghost. The inspired injunction is, Judge not unrighteously that ye be not judged, but judge righteous judgment. No such judgment has changed that. There is no such thing as judge not that ye be not judged. We all have to make judgments every day, hundreds of times a day. Unrighteous judgment would be the condemnation of others. That we do not have the right to do. Only Christ has the power, insight, and wisdom to do such. 
righteous judgment would be then in judging people's actions and not willing to follow after unrighteous actions. But to make assumptions about people and condemn them, that is unrighteous judgment. The phrase, which does not belong to you but to God, meant the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell thereon. In other words, only God can condemn. That does not belong to us. Chapter 4, verse 23, the phrase, his substance shall perish with him, meant if we withhold our substance from the poor and the needy out of condemnation, then our substance which perish with us, I'm sorry, let me read it. If we, without our, if we withhold our substance from the poor and the needy out of condemnation, then our substance which perish with us. To those of our day, the Lord has said, If any man shall take of the substance which I have made, and part, impart not his portion according to the love of my gospel, and to the poor and the needy, he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Chapter 4, verses 24 to 28, here King Benjamin makes an appropriate application of what could be called the doctrine of intent, that is, the principle that we are judged by the intent of our hearts. Those unable to give must still have in their hearts the fixed determination to share with those in need and the longing that a time will come when they are in a position to do so. Should that not be their intent, sorry for the typo, and desire, they are as much to be condemned as those who have refused to be caring of others. To retain a remission of our sons, we must, one, impart of our substance to the poor as much as we are able according to their wants in so much as they are justifiable. In expanding this principle, modern revelation makes reference to wants and needs inasmuch as the wants are just. Number two, doing so in wisdom and order, that a man should not run faster than he has strength, to see to it that such efforts do not neglect the needs of their families. Elder Neil A. Maxwell pointed out that we have limited time and energy, so we must focus on that which is most important. Quote, when we run faster than we are able, we get both inefficient and tired. I have on my office wall a wise and useful reminder from Anne Morrow Lindbergh concerning one of the realities of life. She wrote, My life cannot implement into action the demands of all the people to whom my heart responds. That's good counsel for all of us, not an excuse to forgo duty, but as a stage point about pace and the need for quality and relationships. And number three, that we should be diligent, which means being consistent. And four, that which we borrow from another is returned to them. Chapter 4, verse 30, the phrase, watch yourselves, means there is no recess in the struggle to discipline and school our spirits. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime. Even to the New World Twelve, Christ said, You must watch and pray always, lest you be tempted by the devil, and you be led captive by him. Let's now go to Mosiah chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a divine institution. It is led by prophets and apostles, men with seer, seer's vision. The church is, however, only a means to an end, the vehicle which administers the saving or gospel. The great challenge in life is for men and women to receive the everlasting gospel, participate in the ordinance of salvation, live worthy of the powers of godliness, put off the natural man and grow in righteousness so that they might enjoy a mature spiritual union with the Lord whose they are. It is a rich blessing to belong to the only true and living church upon the face of the whole earth. Yet membership in the church is not enough. We are neither saved nor damned as congregations. Salvation is not found in occupying the right pew. 
Alma reported the Lord is saying that all citizens of the earthly kingdom must be born again, yea, born of God, changed from their carnal and fallen state to a state of righteousness, being redeemed of God, becoming his sons and daughters. Thus they become new creatures, and unless they do this, they can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Given the importance of the new birth and the confusion often surrounding its true nature, it will be helpful to a proper understanding of this subject if we here identify at least some of the basic doctrines, doctrinal concepts associated with it, which are 1. Both the baptism of water and the baptism of the Spirit symbolize rebirth. The baptism of water is accomplished through immersion by one having the authority, thereby allowing the initiate, the initiate, initiate to demonstrate his or her acceptance of the atonement of the Lord our Redeemer. One goes down into the watery grave in remembrance of Christ's death and burial. One comes forth out of the water in remembrance of his coming forth of the tomb unto the resurrected glory. That's the symbol of baptism. Baptism does not wash away sin. The Holy Ghost is the one who takes away sin and burns it out, even as though by fire. Baptism is in similitude of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's stop teaching at baptismal ceremonies that baptism washes away sin. The Holy Ghost takes care of that. Know ye not, Paul asked the Romans, that so many of us were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death, therefore were buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we shall also if we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. When a person is confirmed a member of the church, he is directed to receive the Holy Ghost. This is an imperative statement, a command. There is no salvation save the command be heeded. Through the new, through the new members living worthy of the companionship of the Holy Ghost, the second part, if the baptismal ordinance, of the baptismal ordinance, the birth of the Spirit begins. Spiritual, spiritually, this process is be is called the baptism of fire. The Holy Ghost is a sanctifier who burns dross and iniquity out of the soul as if by fire. That's where cleansing of sin comes from. Thus, the remission of sin comes only after the reception and cleansing influence of the Holy Ghost. Nephi explained, Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and Redeemer should do. For this God have they been shown unto me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism of water, and then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost, not because of baptism. Let's teach this right and quit teaching that baptism is symbolic of washing our sins away. It is not. A remission of your sins come by the fire of the Holy Ghost. Baptism is symbolic of the death and resurrection of Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie wrote, Sins are remended, not in the waters of baptism, as we say in speaking figuratively, but when we receive the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Spirit of God that erases carnality and brings us into a state of righteousness. We become clean when we actually receive the fellowship and companionship of the Holy Ghost. End of his quote. You might as well baptize a bag of sand as a man, said Joseph Smith, if not done in view of the remission of sins and getting of the Holy Ghost. Baptism by water is but half a baptism. It is good for nothing without the other half. That is, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the doctrine. Number two, one must be born again to both see and hear I'm sorry, to both see and enter the kingdom of God. A large segment of Christianity believes that being born again consists in receiving the sacraments of the church, while other segments feel that being born again is to have a personal spiritual experience with the Lord. 
Truth takes a road between them both. Joseph Smith expressed it thus, quote, Being born again comes by the Spirit of God through ordinances. That is, both ordinances and spiritual experiences are requisite for the change described in Scripture as the new birth. Joseph Smith explained, quote, It is one thing to see the kingdom of God and quite another thing to enter into it. We must have a change of heart to see the kingdom of God and subscribe to the articles of adoption to enter therein, end of quote. To see the kingdom of God is to recognize that church in one's day, which is the Lord's church, to sense and feel the truthfulness of its pronouncements and authenticity of its priesthood, and to acknowledge that those who present the gospel message are true servants of God. One comes to see the kingdom, that is, to recognize the truths of salvation as the Holy Ghost grants to him the eyes of faith. One enters the kingdom, as the prophet explained, through the subscribing to the articles of adoption, which are the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, baptism, and the reception of the Holy Ghost. These allow one to, le to be legally adopted into the family of the Lord Jesus Christ and into the church and the kingdom of God on earth. Number three, the new birth brings a change of attitude and character. Those who have been born again have crucified the old man of sin. They, are, they who are in Christ represent a new creation of the Holy Ghost. One who is born again does not continue in sin, for such a one has no more disposition to do evil but to do good continually. To be born again is to be converted. Membership in the church and conversion are not necessarily synonymous, said President Marion G. Romney. Continuous quote, being converted and having a testimony are not necessarily the same thing. A testimony comes when the Holy Ghost gives the earnest seeker a witness of the truth. A moving testimony vitalizes faith, that is, it induces repentance and obedience to the commandments. Conversion, on the other hand, is the fruit of, or the reward for, repentance and obedience. Conversion is affected by divine forgiveness which remits sins. Thus, he is converted to a newness of life. His spirit is healed. End of quote. Elder Orson Pratt explained concerning the power of the Holy Ghost, quote, Water baptism is only a preparatory cleansing of the believing penitent, whereas the baptism of fire in the Holy Ghost cleanses more thoroughly by renewing the inner man and by purifying the affections, desires, and thoughts which have long been habituated in the impure ways in sin. Without the aid of the Holy Ghost, a person would, not, would have but very little power to change his mind at once from its habit, habituated course and to walk in a newness of life. So great is the force of habit that he would, without being renewed by the Holy Ghost, be easily overcome and contaminated again with sin. Hence, it is infinitely important that the affections and the desires should be, in measure, changed and renewed, so as to cause him to hate that which he before loved and to love that which he before hated. To thus renew the mind of man is the work of the Holy Ghost. End of quote. Number four. The new birth brings new knowledge, new insights, and new direction to life. The Holy Ghost is a revelator, and he makes known the things of God to those who are ready to bear them. The Holy Ghost reveals matters which man cannot teach, nor man's wisdom convey. Brigham Young said that the Holy Ghost reveals tr heaven's treasures to its disciples. Quote, it shows them things past, present, and to come. It opens the vision of the mind, unlocks the treasures of wisdom, and they begin to understand the things of God. They comprehend themselves and the great object of their existence. End of quote. The Spirit brings certitude and conviction and banishes the, doubtness, the darkness of doubt. Cyprian, a great defender of the faith after the apostolic period, spoke of his own conversion. Into my heart, he recounted, purified of all sin, there entered a light which came from on high, and then suddenly, in a marvelous manner, I saw certainty succeed doubt. 
to know God, our eternal Father, and Jesus Christ, whom he sent, President Marion G. Romney explained, one must, as did the apostles of old, learn of them through the process of divine revelation. One must be born again. Number five, those who are born again are received into a new family. They become the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. As the Savior and foreordained Messiah, Jesus Christ became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him, and the Father's gospel became his by adoption. Thus we know it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Things on earth are patterned after that which is in heaven. God dwells in the family unit. Those who accept the gospel of Jesus Christ enter the family of Jesus Christ, take upon them the family name, and thus become inheritors of family obligations and family privileges. All must be born into the family of Christ by conversion. Because the hearts of the saints are changed through faith on his name, they become the sons and daughters of their Lord. Because of the resurrection and the atonement and being born again, we thus become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. He becomes, in a sense, our eternal Father. The Savior, in speaking to those of our day, said, Hearken unto my voice of the Lord your God, while I speak unto you. For verily I say unto you, All those who receive my gospel are sons and daughters in my kingdom. Thus it is that the saints are born of Christ, because they have been born of the Spirit. They are alive in Christ because they enjoy the companionship of the Spirit, and they are members of his family because they are clean, and he is as he is clean. Those who have given strict heed to the words of the prophets are thus known as the seed of Christ, persons who are heirs of the kingdom of God, those for whom he has died. Number six, birth is the beginning. The journey of faith lies ahead. It was never intended that those of the households of faith remain children forever, even children of Christ. When the members of the church receive the ordinance of salvation, and they live so as to enjoy the promptings, guidance, and sanctifying powers of the Holy Ghost, when they take upon themselves the name of Christ, forsake the ways of the world, and are born again into the family kingdom of their Savior and Redeemer, when they do these things, they qualify themselves for richer and higher privileges and spiritual opportunities. They then receive the blessings of the temple, particularly the new and everlasting covenants, will gain power to become the sons and daughters of God, meaning the Father. They become joint heirs or core co-inheritors with Christ to all that the Father has. They are entitled to the blessings of the firstborn. Wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Number seven, though the new birth is a result of a definite time of decision, a desire for the things of righteousness, it is usually a quiet but powerful process. It is true that certain individuals, such as Alma, Paul, and King Lamoni, underwent dramatic and miraculous sudden conversions. They were born again through a singular experience, and no doubt others in our day changed from wickedness to strength in a wonderful fashion. These, however, are exceptions rather than the rule. There are few sudden disciples, few instant Christians. The Holy Ghost generally makes saints out of sinners in the process of time. Of Christ, our prototype, the revelations attest, he receives not of the fullness. Even Christ grew from grace to grace. Here, there, here a little, and there a little, line upon line, and precept upon precept. El Bruce on the Conky taught, a person may get converted in a moment miraculously. That is what happened to Alma the Younger. He had been baptized in his youth. He had been promised the Holy Ghost, but he had never received it. He was too worldly wise. He went off with the sons of Mosiah to destroy the church. Alma was in this state, and then, his, then this occasion occurred, when a new light came into his soul, when he was changed from his fallen and carnal state to a state of righteousness. 
In his instance, the conversion was miraculous, in the snap of a finger almost, but that is not how it happens with most people. With most people, conversion is a process, and it goes step by step, degree by degree, level by level, from a lower state to a higher state, from grace to grace, until the time that the individual is wholly turned to the cause of righteousness. Now, this means that an individual overcomes one sin today and another sin tomorrow. He perfects his life in one field now and another field later on, and the conversion process goes on until it is complete, until we become literally, as the Book of Mormon says, saints of God instead of natural men. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 2, the phrase, We believe all the words which thou hast spoken. One of the true signs of conversion is an intelligent acceptance of the words of the Lord's anointed. President Harold B. Lee frequently observed that, quote, a man or woman is not fully converted unless he sees the power of God resting upon the leaders of this church, and it goes down into his heart like fire. The phrase in verse 2, we have no more dispositions to evil, means the mighty change associated with the new birth results in an educated, conscious, educated desires, educated and bridled passions. Alma spoke of the ancient saints who had received the priesthood of Melchizedek and who through their faith and obedience were sanctified and their garments were washed white through the blood of the Lamb. Now they, after being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, having their garments made white, being pure and spotless before God, could not look upon sin, save it were with, with abhorrence. And there were many, exceedingly many, who were made pure and entered into the rest of the Lord. Likewise, after Ammon had preached to King Lamoni and his subjects, they did all declare unto the people the self-same thing, that their hearts had been changed, that they had no more desire to do evil. And behold, many did declare unto the people that they had seen angels and had conversed with them, and thus they had told them many things of God and of his righteousness. El Robert D. Hell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained the process by which we experience the change of heart. Quote, Once we receive a witness of the Spirit, our testimony is strengthened through study, prayer, and loving the gospel. Our growing testimony brings us increased faith in Jesus Christ and his plan of happiness. We are motivated to repent and obey the commandments, which, with a mighty change of heart, leads to our conversion. And our conversion brings divine forgiveness, healing, and joy and the desire to bear our witness to others. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 3, the phrase, And were expedient, we could prophesy of all things, referred to. The spirit of revelation is the spirit of prophecy, that same spirit by which one gains remission of sins, by which he loses all desire for future sin. That same spirit grants to faithful men and women greater views of that which is to come, allowing them, when appropriate, to prophesy of all things. Chapter 5, verse 4, the phrase, and it is the faith which we have on these things, meaning faith brings knowledge, a knowledge which everlastingly enriches the soul. The command of the Lord is always to seek learning, even by study and by faith. So we are not only to seek learning the gospel by studying the scriptures, but by doing the gospel. That's what it means, by faith. Faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it done, and how he wants it done. And so we learn gospel principles and truth by doing what God wants. Chapter 5, verse 5, the phrase, We are willing to enter into a covenant referred to. It would appear that King Benjamin's mighty sermon was the form for a large covenant renewal ceremony that is to say the people of king benjamin were already members of the church they had been baptized at the time of their initial conversion or as the arrival at the years of accountability they had previously taken upon themselves the name of christ and they now renewed those commitments to keep the commandments of god the remainder of their days the phrase in chapter verse 5, in all things that he shall command us, meant true saints are eager to know and keep all of God's laws and statutes. They are not selective in regard to the commandments of heaven. They do not read the scriptures with a blind eye. They live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. Salvation is not found in partial truths or in partial acceptance of the truth. 
The phrase, justice cannot be denied, endless torment remains. Those who have sown the seeds of righteousness will harvest as they have sown. Those who have reveled in the sowing of evil seeds and remained unrepentant must endlessly feast on the bitter fruits of their own planting. Endless, as used here in such texts, refers to the quality or nature of the parish punishment rather than to its duration. In other words, endless torment means godly torment, not that there's no end to it, because endless is the name, is one of the names of Christ and God. So endless torment is to be, have godly torment. And those who go through that will be those who enter the terrestrial, the telestial kingdom. You have to go through hell and that kind of torment in order to qualify for redemption in the telestial kingdom. You can read about that in section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Chapter 5, verse 7, the phrase, called the children of Christ. Those of the household of faith never lose their relationship with Elohim the Father. He was and is the Father of the spirits of all men and will forever be the ultimate object of their worship and devotion. Because Jehovah became the chief advocate and proponent of the plan of the Father, because he offered himself a ransom for the souls of his spirit brothers and sisters, and because he makes the terms and conditions of the Father's plan operative and thus available to mankind, he becomes the Father of their spiritual rebirth, the Father of their resurrection, the Father of their salvation. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, and men and women become begotten sons and daughters of Jesus Christ by covenant. Entrance, I mean adoption, into his family kingdom is accomplished through a solemn agreement to take the family name, the name of Christ, living in harmony with the standards of that covenant family, and thus adhere to family obligations. Those who do so make permanent their place in the family. They are sealed to God who loves them, and thereby inherit and possess as heirs the fullness of the glory of their Lord. Notice, when we are born down here, we are created. Christ was the only begotten in the flesh mortality. The way we then can become begotten sons and daughters is then through the covenant relationship and of covenanting with the covenants of God and attaining the blessings of the atonement of Jesus Christ. President Joseph Finley Smith explained how we may consider Jesus Christ as our Father. Quote, if we speak of Jesus Christ as being our Father, we are not making any mistake because spiritual, spiritually He begotten us. No question about it. He united spirit and body, providing a resurrection for every living thing. We do not make any mistakes in speaking of the Savior as our God, as our Father, and also as the Son of God, because He received all authority. Jesus declared the Father conferred all authority upon him, and so he becomes to us a Father. Moreover, he begot us spiritually in the resurrection. We are his sons and his daughters. He is the Father to us because he begotten us and saved us from death, uniting us spirit and body. What is a Father but one who gives life? End of quote. Chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, taking upon us his name. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Corner of the Twelve Apostles deepened our understanding of taking the name of Christ upon us. Quote, we see that we take upon us the name of Christ when we are baptized in his name, when we belong to his church and profess our belief in him, and when we do the work of his kingdom. There are other meanings as well, deeper meanings, that the more mature members of the church should understand and ponder as he or she partakes of the sacrament. It is significant that when we partake of the sacrament, we do not witness that we take upon us the name of Christ. We witness that we are willing to do so. The fact that we only witness to our willingness suggests that something else must happen before we actually take the sacred name upon us in the most important sense. Willingness to take upon us the name of Christ can therefore be understood as willingness to take upon us the authority of Jesus Christ. According to this meaning, by partaking of the sacrament, we witness our willingness to in 
to participate in the sacred ordinances of the temple and to receive the highest blessings available through the name and the authority of the Savior when he chooses to confer them upon us. Now, breaking from the quote just for a minute, I would not partake of the sacrament then if you are not willing to go through the temple and accept the covenants and ordinances of the temple. Because in partaking of the sacrament, you are promising him that you will do so. And if you do not, then you are trying to deceive the Savior and you are making a covenant wickedly. You are being deceptive in your solemn oath. This is why partaking of the sacrament is so sacred. You are making promises to make further covenants. And if you are not willing to do that, then do not take the sacrament, because you will just damn yourself. Now back to Elder Oaks. Our willingness to take upon us the name of Christ affirms our commitment to do all that we can to be counted among those whom he will choose to stand at the right hand and be called by his name at the last day. In this sacred sense, our witness that we are willing to take upon the name of Christ constitutes our declaration of a candidacy, candidacy for exaltation in a celestial kingdom. Exaltation is eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. End of quote. So the ultimate place we will take upon his name is when we reach exaltation in the celestial kingdom. If we are not willing to take upon our Christ in that way, then do not partake of the sacrament. Because you are promising that you are willing to take upon his name. And the only way you can fully do that is through temple ordinances and then living in a way that enables you to reach exaltation. Chapter 5, verse 9, the right hand of God. The right hand or side is called the dexter and the left, the sinister. Dexter connotes something favorable. Sinister on the hand suggests something unfavorable or unfortunate. The Lord has frequently utilized the distinction to contrast the blessed state of those who are loyal to him and keep his commandments, those on his right hand, and the pitiable, pitiable condition of those who come to know his wrath and displeasure, those on his left hand. Fear thou not, Jehovah spoke through Isaiah, for I am with thee, and be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. In the words of the Savior, the sheep, those entitled to his blessings, sit on his right hand, while the goats, those worthy of punishment and rejections, will sit on his left. Those found on the right hand of Christ know the name by which they are called, the name of Christ. Chapter 5, verse 11, never should be blotted out except through transgression meant. Birthrights can be lost. One can be disinherited, can lose the privileges and blessings of membership in the royal family. Neither men nor demons can rob one of rightful family ties. On the other hand, impurity and disloyalty can sever one from the honors of heirship. The phrase, take heed that you do not transgress, meant Benjamin's plea was a call to vigilance, a warning to be spiritually alert to avoid transgression. Chapter 5, verse 12, hearken and know the voice by which you are called. Jesus taught that his sheep know his voice, that is, those who have believing blood, those who develop the capacity and talent for spiritual, spirituality in the premortal world, these recognize the voice of Christ in this life, the testimony of the true servants of God spoken by the power of the Holy Ghost. The elect hear the voice of the Lord, they harden not their hearts. Further, they hear the voice of Christ calling from deep within the recesses of their own soul. They listen to and respond to the voice of conscience, the light of Christ. Our knowledge of persons and things before we came here, explained Joseph F. Smith, combined with the divinity awakened within our souls through obedience to the gospel, powerfully affects, in my opinion, all our likes and dislikes, and guides our, pres our preferences in the course of this life, provided we give careful heed to the admonitions of the Spirit. All those salient truths which come home so forcibly to the head and heart seem but the awakening of the memories of the Spirit. Can we know anything here that we did not know before we came here? If Christ knew beforehand, so did we. 
But in coming here we forgot all, that our agency might be free indeed to choose good or evil, that we might merit the reward of our own choice and conduct. By the power of the Spirit in the redemption of Christ through obedience, we often catch a spark from the awakened memories of the immortal soul, which lights up our whole being as with the glory of our former home. Brothers and sisters, we were taught all the gospel complete in its fullness before we came here. We are down here now to remember that and to live up to the covenants we covenanted before we ever came here. We covenanted with God to return. Now, will you be true to that covenant? That is yet to be seen. Elder M. Russell Ballard, Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that God expects us to hear and know his voice in this life. Quote, when my ministry is over, it will not be any talk that I give that will be very important in the sight of the Lord. But what will be important to him will be my hearing his voice and responding to his promptings. End of quote. Chapter 5, verse 13, the phrase, How knoweth the master whom he has not served? meant, we come to know the Lord through serving the Lord, and we serve the Lord by serving others. Through living as he lived, through acts of kindness, deeds of service, and thus through obedience and works of righteousness, we come to think and act as our master would. We come to know him. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Chapter 5, verse 15, the word immovable. To be immovable in righteousness is to be consistent when it comes to matters of values and faith and courage. To be immovable is to have an allegiance to principles that is independent of circumstance and situation. It is to be firm in one's commitment to the truth, steady in one's loyalty to the eternal verities. The phrase that Christ may seal you his refers to, Benjamin's plea, his invitation to his people, is the same as Nephi's. You must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God of all men. Wherefore, if you will press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Christ seals us his through granting to us the promise of salvation in the highest heaven, through giving us the more sure word of prophecy. In verse 5, the phrase brought to heaven meant to be brought to heaven is to receive the peaceful assurance that we will, be, will obtain eternal life. We are still to Christ when we have received the ratifying sanction of the Holy Spirit of promise, that is, the Holy Ghost, placing his stamp of approval upon all the ordinances of salvation into which we have entered thus assures that they will be of efficacy, virtue, and force in and after the resurrection. Now to Mosiah chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Appoint a priest to teach. Stir them up in remembrance of the oath, refers to. It is not enough to preach the gospel, even to preach with the power of a King Benjamin. Once the word has been delivered, once the witness has been planted, once commitment and conversion are forthcoming, then wise leaders begin an ongoing task through reminders, through encouragement, and through repeated visits. They do all in their power to stir up the people in remembrance of their solemn promise that they might retain a remission of their sins. Wise under-shepherds, those given the responsibility to guide the Lord's flock, labor ceaselessly to keep the spiritual spark alive, to keep the flame of faith burning in the hearts of their people. Chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, Mosiah walked in the ways of the Lord. That phrase meaning Mosiah will later explain that it is better that a man should be just of God than of man, for the judgments of God are always just, but the judgments of man are not always just. Therefore, if it were possible that you could have just men to be your kings, who would establish the laws of God and judge his people according to his commandments, yea, if you could have men for your kings who would do even as my father King Benjamin did for this people, I say unto you, if this could always say unto you, if this could always have kings if this, could, then you could always have kings to rule over you. The phrase caused the people to till the earth and not become burdensome. Also, I encourage people to be active and industrious, eager to work and labor and provide for their temporal needs. 
Work brings happiness, Spencer W. Kimball explained. It is the means of all accomplishment. If it is accomplishment, it is the opposite of idleness. We are commanded to work. Attempts to obtain our temporal, social, emotional, spiritual being by means of a dull, violent, divine mandate that we should work for what we receive. Work should be the ruling principle in the lives of our church membership. End of quote. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you. Help us to keep our commitments to the Savior, to come unto Christ, and to become his begotten sons and daughters. What a privilege it is to live in a time to have the fullness of the gospel. If you enjoyed the presentation, please hit the like button.